awesome. So uh, thank you people that are viewing this video. You'll probably see it first on Freeman TV Raw. Um, my name is Garrett Ian, as many people know, and I'm here with, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Ethan Glover. And you are a recent mover to New Hampshire? That's right. Yeah. And before you moved here, you were kind of keeping an eye on the activities that were going on here and also giving your own commentary online. Sure, so you yeah, expand yeah. on that. I had a, a few criticisms of, um, at first it was the whole the Robin Hooding thing and the, uh, the harassment of the, uh, the meter maids. It seems like that could have been handled a lot better. So I just put my thoughts out about it out there. And, and most of your, your commentary related to Robin Hooding, was it directed at any specific individuals? Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, I try to get to everyone, but Cantwell and Ian were, I think, the two prominent ones in, in that, that one. Yeah, so um, I myself have been a vocal critic of Chris Cantwell since around the time I moved to Keene. Before yeah, yeah. I had moved to Keene, I had lived in Concord and I had known who he was. Um, I had seen that he had done an introductory blog on Free Keene um, for a 420 event. Um, but he was not, I guess he was never officially a blogger. Um, now, he, when he left New Hampshire a few years ago, um, Ian Freeman, the founder of Free Keen, um, one of the bloggers there, of course, I'm also a blogger there, uh, identified Christopher Cantwell as an advocate of violence, based on yeah. his words. Now, Chris Cantwell in that time has not revoked or apologized or withdrawn any statements he's made. As far as I know, he doesn't do that. No. Um, so, at some point, people in Keene, Ian and others, have changed their opinions about him, not based on him changing his positions, but based on their own changes of position relative to what is peace, what is advocacy of violence, etc. Well, then you get people just kind of getting used to Chris, you know, that that's just the way it is, it is and you kind of have to accept that, so you kind of just, people get, I guess, indoctrinated with the guy. Some would say that's almost cult-like behavior to sort of excuse uh, excuse a transgression because of some sort of credit that one has. Yeah, that's this definitely. I mean, he gets his his blog and everything isn't really that big of a deal, but he certainly gets attention, and I think people want to like him, and so they they look for any reason to, and they're willing to make a lot of excuses in order to uh, consider him as a friend, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting uh, if somebody's. Uh, that's almost like to say that if someone is doing the same transgressions outside of one's presence, if that's all they see is the transgressions, they'll already form an opinion of this person beforehand. But in Chris's case, you've made some claims against him that I feel that others have sort of blown off or ignored, uh, specifically that he's committed theft, uh, that he's committed fraud, um, that he's lied about how much money he makes, that he's lied about um, uh, just past instances. Um, do you feel that there's a reason that uh, people aren't, either haven't, is it possibly they haven't heard the claims that you've made, or uh, that are there others that, uh, you know, verify some of that information? Well, the person who came to me with, like, the, the biggest accusations, like theft and everything, the first time he tried to say something, he actually kind of made the mistake of doing it in a comment section on Chris's website, and that resulted not only getting banned, but he got a lot of harassment right back at him, and um, there was threats towards his family and everything from his fans. That's, that's sort of the kind of fan base he has. So he wanted me to, to kind of act as a voice, and that's, I just told what he said to me. And, and um, is this the person who uh, allegedly was a victim of theft from Chris, or is this somebody who was the person in the video with the bear mace? Yeah, this is a, the guy he went to in the middle of the night and threatened with Bear Mace over a Facebook argument over like a joint Facebook account the guy had. Mm. Do you know if that person ever shared the uh, information from like that Facebook argument or if there's any redact like chance that people could see the redacted original discussions that Chris had with these people? I'm not sure. I think there might be someone that has screenshots, but I think the conversation is probably gone at this point. Like the actual live version. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that is something to consider that many people will consider something gossip until there's some sort of physical yeah. evidence presented of it, like screenshots and, uh, yeah, and I mean, uh, or at the very least, like you know, some evidence of the theft. But Chris has his own blog of the event. And I think he's 
showing some information from that, and he doesn't hide the fact that what he did was because of just a sort of argument on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think that leads to a very interesting discussion about escalation of force, whereas he, he claims this person was threatening him online. Um, I haven't seen the conversation, I don't know if they were, that should, probably should have shared that in the beginning of the video, whatever the threat was, but he didn't in the video that I saw. Um, but yes, it very much did disturb me when I saw the video that, where he goes to someone's house in the middle of the night, Bear Mace, he runs onto their lawn like he's yeah. violating their property rights, which is allegedly like the one big no-no of an anarcho-capitalist world is not to occupy property if the owner doesn't want you to. Um, now, that, that, that uh, incident, that is something that is kind of ignored, uh, overlooked by people. Um, do you try to have you tried to like address that specific issue with people and like what have their what responses have you seen to that when you try and address it? Um, anytime I bring up anything about Cantwell, it's kind of like, well, you know, he has this these things in the past, but overall he's a good guy. You know, I talked to the person; he's really not that bad. So I think most of the time, conversationally, he isn't. You know, with his friends, he isn't too bad, but he's he's still you know every week he's got some sort of fuck up that happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a manager, we called them ministers at the time, prior to there being a Shire Free Church. There was no religious connotation there. Um, I myself was a minister of the CAC along with Daryl W. Perry and uh, Ian being the property owner at that time uh, when there was one decision to actually ban Cantwell from the property as opposed to him not being a member or not being a guest or whatever. Right. Um, and that was based on uh, issues that were brought to my attention from a member about things he wrote relative to the Gabby Gifford shooting. And he was sort of applauding this violent act that occurred that even resulted in what Cantwell would consider innocent victims, like a young child that got shot and killed in that incident. Um, and he was applauding the fact this violence happened, but he was saying he wasn't advocating it. He was just enjoying the fact that it occurred. Sure. And um, to me as an activist, I, I felt that that very much mur muddied the waters of what it meant to uh, value human life, um, and to value human rights, that just because somebody disagrees with you on guns or something doesn't mean they should be shot and that it's some sort of like great act right. of karma. Yeah. Um, I felt like that sort of public relations uh, image was important to people at some point, but as I said, like the, the importance of that may have like, may have disappeared over some time, but. Yeah, he actually had an article where he said, there were two murders of two cops up in uh, New York, and um, some people were saying that was leading to a drop in arrest. It turns out there's like a protest going on of the mayor, but he was saying that that did more good than the libertarian movement has ever had done in its entire history. When That's I, quite a claim. When I asked um, why he wouldn't go around killing cops in, on his website, someone said basically Cantwell's too important in order to do that sort of thing. So. It's kind of like a, a cultish red flag. Maybe he was trying to get his, his audience, but I, mean, I don't know what he's trying to go for there, or, or if it's just shock value, you know? Well, um, this is something interesting I see about uh, sort of pseudo-anarchist communities. It's real folks that consider themselves anarchists. I mean, I hate to be the one identifying the real anarchists or anything, but yeah. um, the idea that one should oppose hierarchy and rank and structure um, and have horizontal organization um, and that is something that is lacking when we see with like Cantel, there's almost like a regiment to it where people will say that the ideas he's spouting are good but that he can't do them because he's too important. It's almost like this yeah. sort of uh, figure is being created as though it's an intellectual figure. And he's an, he's an intelligent person, I will give him that. He can, you know, formulate words well, but um, making claims like you, you pointed out that's very, uh, that lacks a lot of sociological analysis and cultural analysis oh, yeah. to blame like it, to make such a judgment over two groups of uh, factors on society, um, and especially considering that there, were, as you said, there was a larger issue going on there than the murder of those police. Yeah. Um, now, one th uh, another thing I wanted to bring out about your your claims about what was going on with Cantwell um, in the article, there were three articles that I thought had some significance uh, to this discussion. One you posted on January twenty second, or at least that's when it was dated. How not to sell libertarianism. Yeah. yeah. And it seemed to be mostly a critique of Cantwell's approach to Robin Hooding. Um, there were some things in that article I thought maybe were written under the impression that Cantwell was officially associated with Robin Hood of Keene when he never really was. Right. He was interested in what we were doing and came around and did his own thing pretty sure. much. Okay. 
Like he was, uh, yeah, just to clarify, he was never invited by Robin Hood of Keen like to come out per se, um, as, as far as like myself or James as the people involved at that time go. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe Ian invited him out, but you know, at, we, we yeah. pretty much had open invitation for anyone to come out and you know, do the activity. Yeah, how not to sell libertarians, and that was kind of like, um, I was using Chris as the example of kind of bad publicity, putting by bad publicity on the, on kind of the movement, because, you know, you're trying to go for shock value, just trying to get the views instead of actually reaching out to people that uh, might want to make that switch over to libertarianism, you know, they're on that, that fence and they just kind of need the help for the, the push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I must say that I find it easier to critique some of Chris Cantwell's other activities aside from his participation in interacting with parking enforcers. Yeah. Um, I'd say that was some of the lesser offensive stuff he's done. Uh, but it brings out a good point that just because somebody is uh, like laughing or playing along doesn't mean they necessarily you know, care to. Yeah. Uh, but it is, of course, part of those people's jobs. Um, now, uh, in the case of, like, protecting free speech, I want to make sure that while we're doing this long critique of this one person that we also respect their right to do what they do as long as they're not harming others. And in the sense of free speech, I support uh, Chris Cantwell's right to make a parody Antonio Bueller site. I support his right to make a parody Stop Free Keen site. Um, but a good issue that you raise is that you were censored when you revealed the source of these satire sites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, when I went on this on this Facebook wall and showed these people who actually believe Antonio uh, Bueller dot org is that's Antonio Bueller's website, I showed them that's actually Chris Cantwell. Then he almost immediately banned me uh, from that, and I emailed him about it and asked him why he banned me. He says, "If you want to buy ads on my site, or if you want to advertise on my site, buy ads." Um, I mean, I offered to do that, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny that he was he was a uh, First, he was claiming that I was advertising my website. It was just kind of a link to show um, the owners of the website to, to like this other tool, and um, that, he's, that he thinks I'm trying to spam him because of that. When in reality, I think he's just trying to trying to keep on this this whole fraudulent thing he's got going with Antonio Bueller for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that, an, another thing that's sort of pseudo-fraudulent uh, mentioned briefly was that he represents himself in dating profiles to be making X amount of money. I think I've seen one that's in between uh, fifty and $60,000 a year. Yeah. And yet at the same time he was posting on his uh, blog that at the end of, as a signature almost, at the end of his blogs for a while, I'm in desperate need of cash, please donate. Yeah. Um, have you, have you had a chance to uh, check out M.K. Lord's article, Libertarian Welfare Queens? No, I haven't. All right, so that was written at the end of 2014, and I think it was a very good critique of certain uh, figures in the movement. Um, in a sense, you could say it's almost like an internal cleansing that there's a sort of critique going on. Some people call it infighting, but mm -hmm. I think all discussion is healthy as long as it, it doesn't get terminated uh, undu unduly or get misdirected. Sure. Yeah. Um, but the Libertarian Welfare Queen's article pointed out that uh, of many people like asking for money, um, asking for donations to continue something, um, yet are advocating for uh, things that they don't like, Chris Cantwell, um, Stefan Molyneux, advocating like people break away from their families, um, and not saying that it's like a bad for people to make that decision for themselves, but... Right. Um, so yeah, I would strongly recommend that article for people like on this subject, because Cantwell is mentioned, and um, at the same time, like it's not a... It's one thing to critique someone is not necessarily they're, they're like wronging someone, um, you brought up instances where Cantwell has actually wronged someone, and yeah. I would say that like for all of the arguments that should be made, there should be some prioritizing as far as like when someone's doing something wrong versus when someone's wronging someone versus when they're just being mildly offensive. Right. Yeah, a lot of um, a lot of what I've done with Cantwell at this point is it's mostly a joke because I've, I've tried to reach out to him and um, talk to him about um, things and. If he were actually willing to sit down and talk with me, I'd probably remove most of that stuff. But I, he's, he's kind of what I call a Molyneuxian isolationist. So if he finds one thing he doesn't like about you or makes up one thing he doesn't like about you, he just completely isolates you and refuses to ever have any contact. Mm -hmm. And I would have to concur there is uh, after we asked him to not return to the CAC based on his positions on uh, violence, 
that, uh, yeah, I was blocked by him and uh, I totally ignore it. I mean, I have had some idle conversations in passing with him. Um, we've both been at the same lunch before and sat near each other, but yeah. Um, otherwise, I find that sort of approach, it's not a very, uh, I mean, it's a fine approach for an individual to take, like it's the right to take it, but as far as activism goes, as far as trying to be like a community builder, I think it's um, you know, very awkward. I find it very inhumane yeah. sort of to ignore or like refuse to talk to somebody who's not a threat or like not harming you or like unless they're actively continually annoying you or something. But, yeah, yeah he, he likes to burn bridges whenever he gets a chance and I think eventually he's going to end up in a place where I, it's just him and he's got you know, nobody left. Uh, but he tends to stick to people who he thinks might be helpful to keep him um, relevant close to him and he's those are the people he's willing to talk to privately and apologize to but if he thinks you're weak or something he'll just bully you completely out of his life mm -hmm. um, now one instance where I found almost that I had to you could say defend Cantwell was uh, an instance in which he felt he had to pull a gun on there were three people that were running towards him yeah um, now I must say about that video I felt that there was to a large extent that he wasn't really doing anything in the wrong there. He was walking down the street, he observed some trouble, he was safely, uh, for himself, safely removed from the situation and documenting it without trying to interact with them. Um, it, he then became the subject of it. Um, I must say that, like, as far as his actions in that video, I would not have acted differently with the exception of the fact that I generally don't carry a gun, mm. um, especially not open carrying, it's something I used to do, um, but. I'm just not interested in openly, you know, displaying for others that I have a weapon anymore. Like, I don't see a reason for that. Yeah. Other than that, I believe in the right for people to do so without being threatening. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's just, a, like, one point of contention, I'd say, of your, of your critiques of Cantwell was it seemed that you were very much, in your articles,